Hello, friends. This is the vaguely less congested Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, if I could choose just one work by Composer X, it would have to be Work W. Well, X is Sibelius. You've been talking about him for a while now, and so it's time we got to him, isn't it? And because we could choose albums, yes, as we did with Dvorak and some other select composers, we're going with an album. Why? Because Sibelius was equally adept at two major, very major, forms of orchestral music, the symphony and the symphonic poem, and they're very different. And in Sibelius's hands, extremely personal to the composer. But we have an album that contains one of each, and one of the best of each. And that's the point, of course, that we have something absolutely wonderfully unique. And that album is Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic on Sony Classical doing Symphony Number no. 5 plus Pochola's Daughter. Two absolutely amazing masterpieces in fabulous performances on one little tiny album, one little disc. So we can do it and we can preserve one work in each category. Now, the fascinating thing about Sibelius uh, when it comes to symphonies versus symphonic poems is that there is a kind of myth out there buzzing about that says that symphonies are written in very strict form. They have to follow a certain prescribed form. And symphonic poems are free and poetic and fantastical. Well, with Sibelius, it's just the opposite. And this fact tells us something very, very important about what makes a symphony a symphony and what makes a symphonic poem a symphonic poem. Sibelius's symphonies are organic, unique, sui generis, musical beings. Each one, at least in his hands, had to find its own special form. A symphonic form, granted, that means that means some sort of logical path of, of development and shape and structure, but over a large scale. And each of them does that, but each one is very different. And those forms are not directly, directly categorizable in terms of our usual, well, it's in sonata form with a first subject and a second subject and a development in the middle and a coda with a recapitulation before that. And you know, They don't do that. Not all of them anyway. Some do, or they do it in unusual places and in different ways. His symphonic poems, on the other hand, are almost invariably in strict sonata form, either either the normal kind with a big middle development section, as in Pochiola's daughter, which is exactly what it does, or in what we call slow movement sonata form, the kind that Mozart most enjoyed, which is sonata form without development, A, B, and then A modified, B modified, and then a coda. That's something like the Oceanides and, and a bunch of other things he did. They all take that basic form. And that's really very interesting. Why should something which supposedly illustrates an outside poetic idea um, be in such strict form? Why doesn't it just follow the plot line? Paul Hill's Daughter is a wonderful example because, because it tells a story. And this story involves Weinemoinen, one of the heroes of the Kalevala, having to meet, you know, meeting the daughter of the Northland. That's Pochiola's daughter. The Nor Pochiola is a place. It's not a person. It's the North Country. And, and she gives him three impossible tasks. Well, Sibelius doesn't describe three impossible tasks, actually. He describes two in the development section, because that's formally the only thing that makes sense. That is, a good symphonic poem has to simultaneously give a sense of the external program, the idea that inspired it, but also be a satisfying musical structure in its own life, in its own right, pardon me. And so Sibelius chooses these, these, these very simple, highly structured formal means to tell a story. Because sonata movements, sonata form is also a narrative form. 
it describes actions, things happening. And once you get this feeling of things happening, exactly how many there are or what they are, well, that's not as important. What matters is that feeling of, of, of completeness and wholeness you get from being able to follow a form where you know where you are moving from point to point to point. In a symphony, however, the symphony, as Sibelius conceived it, is something that grows from a little acorn, a mighty oak tree grows. And the Fifth Symphony is an amazing example of that because in its original form, which if Kankrazans has his way, we would lose, <clears throat> which would be terrible, um, its original form was in four movements, not three. But gradually over time, Sibelius realized that because there were thematic linkages between the first two movements, that they were actually one movement, and he had to somehow join them together and make them a, a, a single thing, which he did. And it's fascinating to hear the original version, which is inferior in every way to the, to the final version. And in doing the joining, Sibelius also realized that he created a symphony that had a far more heroic character than he originally thought. You see, he wrote the fifth in the wake of the extremely dark and, and, and mysterious and, and gloomy and tragic fourth symphony. And some of that seeped into the fifth. But when he revised it, he realized, wait a minute, this is its own special thing. And it has to remain its own special thing. And so, and so he toughened up the orchestration where the earlier one had like flutes and oboes and things playing most of the thematic material. Now we have solo trumpets and horns and brass. And he firmed up the tippity writing and, and made that enormous conclusion to the first movement, which, is, which was similar, but not quite to what he originally wrote. And he wrote this enormous climax connecting the two movements. And then of course, there's the amazing coda to the finale with those sledgehammer chords separated by silences. It's very controversial. Some people think it's very effective. Some people think it's not so effective, but it's certainly personal and unique. And so the Fifth Symphony is a wonderful exemplar of the symphonic process Shea Sibelius um, all by itself. But we couldn't stand to lose the others because each one is an individual creative act, completely special and separate. And so the evil god Cancrazans couldn't possibly want us to lose all of those other Sibelius symphonies and indeed the symphonic poems for their different ways of telling a story within a strict formal outline. It's a fabulous thing. And hearing this album with Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic doing the Fifth Symphony and Pochiela's Daughter is a guaranteed way of showing Cancrazans that he must forswear his evil intent and let us keep the entire oeuvre of the great Jean Sibelius. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.